Another emerging challenge is the dropping level of remittances, which people in rural areas, particularly in Latin America and in Asia, rely on to build homes, maintain their homes, and invest in local businesses. This webinar will explore the challenges and implications of these looming questions. I'm going to start by introducing the panelists who we have with us here today. We'll then discuss a few different questions for about an hour, and we'll end with 30 minutes for questions for you, the audience. If you have any questions, please post them using the question feature on the webinar, and we will answer them during the final half hour. I'm pleased to introduce our first panelist, Carl Deering. Carl is the Senior Technical Advisor for Partnerships and Research in CARE's Food and Water Systems team, which includes particular attention to gender transformation. Our next panelist is Shipra Theo, Landessa's Director of Women's Land Rights for India. Our next panelist is Chris Penrose Buckley, Senior Land Policy Lead for the UK Department of International Development, or DFID. And our final panelist is Igor Zvitkovsky, the head of the Transitional and Restitutive Justice Unit for the International Organization of Migration, IOM. We will now move to the questions for panelists, beginning with a question for Carl. As global lockdowns take effect, we see massive amounts of people moving from cities back to their hometowns. What are the broad property rights implications of this migration? And what lessons can be drawn from other epidemics, for example, the Ebola epidemic and natural disasters? Carl, over to you. Thanks a lot, Julia, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, th th it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question to start with. I mean, we are seeing a mixed picture in terms of urban to rural migration. There's some going in the opposite direction, but there's also huge regional variation uh, as far as we understand from our programming e between Asia and Africa, for example. Um, in Kenya and Uganda, for example, urban to rural um, migration is not as significant as it is in parts of Southeast Asia. But on the other hand, we're seeing um, in West Africa, for example, a significant movement of migration or return of um, young women and adolescent girls, for example, from Accra in Ghana to the north to their to their homelands, which is um, uh, a poorer area of Ghana and therefore putting um, reception and family uh, under strain because they're already quite resource poor and uh, food insecure. They're also exposed to um, exploitation and abuse on the way so we're particularly concerned about the um, implications uh, on protection of women and girls because of ur urban to rural migration uh, and I guess what we've learned in the past um, with other humanitarian crises is that the, the more we're ready at the reception end, the better things are. So to prepare uh, local health services uh, and um, GV, GBV prevention and response services, uh, the better we will be. Thank you, Carl. Shipra, over to you. Uh, what is happening in India? Yeah, uh, thank you, Yulia, first of all, for making me a part of this conversation. Uh, with the sudden lockdown in India, we saw migrant workers in urban centers run out of work, out of cash, and absolutely without a safety net. The relief services that were offered to them in the form of food and shelter were highly insufficient in comparison to the distress that was caused and many workers were desperate to return to their villages. The pictures of the pictures of large group of migrants in India walking on feet were noted globally, and even after two months now, the exodus continues. This desperation is an expression of extreme distress, but it also is an expression of people's connection with the land where they are born and grow up. 
that land gives them a sense of security. Uh, that land gives them a sense of security, a sense of safety, and a sense of belongingness. They wanted to be there in the adverse times and believed that they can face all difficulties if they are in their own land, surrounded by their own people. A lesson within this experience in India comes from the state of Kerala uh, that has really emerged as a leader in providing a better system to manage COVID and a state that's been able to move relatively early and with less damage. And this has largely been possible owing to the strong village level governance, a healthy civil society and women's active participation in governance in the states. It's to be noted that Kerala's Kudumbashri program encourages rural women to form self-help groups and then their federation acts as an organized civil society counterpoint to village panchayats. And nearly 65% of all women elected to the panchayats are Kudumbashri's member. It's no coincidence that Kerala happens to be the first state to usher in pro-women land reforms also. And, and more importantly, that these measures were not put in place to fight coronavirus, but rather are a legacy of good state policies that prioritize gender equity and empowerment. And as countries uh, begin to rebuild their economies, one of the critical elements I think should be to strengthen local institutions and ensure women participating, not just in number, but also in skills. I pause here, Yulia. Thank you, Shipra. Uh, Chris, over to you. What do you see as the property rights implications of this migration? Thanks a lot, uh, Yulia, and uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Um, I just, just a few quick preliminary comments. Um, so I think I think the first point I'd make is that I think we we urgently urgently need better data on what is really happening. As as Carl said, I think there's quite a mixed picture in 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 movements between cities and rural areas, um, and I think generally that everyone is is sort of trying to find out better what's happening. And there's anecdotes out there, but I think we need a better overarching picture. I think there's at least four questions that need better. Um, uh, better answers. One is, what are rural people really experiencing themselves? How can we do more rapid assessments to kind of get a better picture of, of, of what their plans are, how it's impacting their livelihoods, etc. And I know some organizations are already commissioning these. How do we kind of pull those to, to inform a better picture globally? Secondly, as I just said, to what extent is de-urbanization really happening? I think this, in my sense is it's more of a South Asian phenomenon uh, or Southeast Asian, but in Africa, it's, it's more mixed. Uh, thirdly, I think we need a better grip on, on the kind of migration that is occurring. So are we talking about internal migration, people moving from cities back to rural areas, which I think has quite different implications from, from long-term international migrants returning home with maybe a stigmatization around um, their, um, 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 where, where they return. Um, and then lastly, um, I think we need to get a better handle on the time dimension to this. I mean, are we going to go back to normal? Probably not in the next few months, uh, but what are the long-term impacts on jobs and whether people will return back quickly? Secondly, I think we need to be asking the right questions. I think a lot of the questions we're discussing today are really important, but I think there's a tendency often at times like this to try and find new problems rather than recognizing that the crisis reveals kind of the existing weaknesses, uh, particularly around the, the rights in informal settlements or the political settlement of land in, in rural areas. And then very, very quickly, lastly, to address the question directly. So I think, I think yes, we do expect increased pressure on land in, in, in rural areas in some countries. And I think, this, I think it's re reasonable to expect that this will drive more intra-household tensions and conflict around land and also within communities. Um, and I think we need to think through how, how this will combine with a kind of widespread sense that there has been a bit of a rollback in governance and oversight in many countries. Uh, the lockdown is diverting attention. And how, how are these things going to come together to affect people's rights uh, wherever they are? I'll stop there. Thanks, Julia. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so we've heard a few interesting points just now. One is the call for action towards better data to understand what is actually happening in the midst of this crisis. And then uh, the other is uh, this 
point that places where institutions were already robust and rights were already strong are not surprisingly responding better. So this is a point towards resilience of institutions and building not just for the best case, but for the worst case. Uh, moving on to question number two, uh, Igor, how do we accommodate all of the people who are returning to the countryside? How do we allocate housing and land to them? How do we resolve disputes that will inevitably arise? Uh, what should be uh, happening in rural communities now to prepare? Igor, I think you're on mute. Yeah, now I'm, I'm, I should be on. Hi, thank you, Julia. Um, and hi, everyone on the, uh, who is participating and, and listening to this. And thank you very much for organizing it. I mean, it's a, it, you know, it's not one question, it's a several questions that you put in one place. <laughs> so it's very difficult to answer. But I think one common thing that we need to understand in order to be able to answer all of these questions that you, that you posted here would be to look at actually who is returning. You know? And I think that's very critical. We need to understand that whether we are talking about migrants or in some cases we would have high DPs who are typically uh, either displaced because of conflict or because of natural disasters and they're mostly concentrated in urban areas. Uh, and in some cases, and then we have to further differentiate if we, if we are talking about migrants, are we are talking about long-term migrants or short-term migrants? And that would inform us, so, so to say, you know, what's gonna uh, wait for them if they decide to return. And the other question that we need to look at it is, uh, uh, are they going to return uh, on a more long-term basis or it's gonna be short-term return? So all this should basically inform, you know, the policies and strategies that different stakeholders uh, need to develop in order to accommodate the return uh, of the migrants or other displaced uh, 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 population. And when I say old stakeholders, I think it should be multi-stakeholder approach, that we, which means we should, it should be not left only up to the communities and up to the migrants, you know, to rely on their community or individual res resilience. Uh, but it, the governments, they should have a role and they should play a role, particularly if we're talking about uh, a more uh, uh, long-term uh, arrangements. Now, certainly there will be a problem, the problems, uh, and they will depend on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, if, it, if you're talking migrants, they might have already sold, in many cases, most of the properties in order to be able to migrate, whether nationally or internationally. And then it would be difficult for them to go back if they don't have anything. And if you're talking, for example, IDPs on the other side, you know, if there are conflict in this IDPs, there will be challenged with reintegration because uh, 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 it might lead to additional uh, uh, um, ethnic tensions and so and so. Of course, we will talk a little bit more about uh, that later, you know, but there should be adequate dispute resolution mechanisms put in place. And the state, as I mentioned, should play the role, including all other stakeholders from communities, private sectors, religious leaders, community leaders, and so and so. So I will stop there and we'll be happy to elaborate more if needed. Thank you. Thank you, Igor. Shipra, moving over to you, um, what do you see happening in the countryside in India as people are returning from the cities? Uh, thank you, Yulia. And in India, it's clearly visible that this rural migration, footloose migrants when they return to their home is creating new pressures, more mouths to feed, more people sharing level space. And I think it all may result in greater frustration, domestic violence, and child abuse. There will also be pressure on village commons with more people back in the village. There will be greater demand for agricultural work. Existing agricultural land will also see intensification. And in remote areas, we may also see pressure on forests to make land available for agriculture. Given all this, I think state governments should make plans to allot common lands to returning migrants, criteria for identification of landless and land allocation to landless should be revisited, made more flexible and revised so more people are embraced into it. More people get, can get a benefit of having a small, there should be Explicit guidelines to recognize and prioritize women as a tau title holder uh, in these places. I think it's also important that government should prioritize stronger records for people. India, for example, has recent land rights scheme called Swami Scheme, uh, which aims at mapping uh, previously undocumented rural property boundaries and provide property cards to rural households across the country. 
it's important to actively engage communities when field validation of property owners is being conducted as part of this scheme or any other scheme. I think without effective community participation, conflict and discontent are bound to result from processes that attempt to define land rights. And efforts such as these must prioritize rights to women of all kinds and at all places. Thank you, Shipra. Yeah. Um, Chris, uh, what are your thoughts on this question? Yeah, I, I think I think Igor's points are really um, important. I think we need to really distinguish between the kind of migration and also get a better handle on the, the length of time we're talking about, because I think that will really have a big uh, impact on, on, on how this plays out and what needs to be done. Um, I think certainly for in countries where there has been significant uh, uh, urban to rural migration. I think accommodation certainly in the short term is probably less of an issue because many of them will be accommodated within family homes. I think the more pressing challenges um, are going to be cash and food um, and, and, and the, the, the use of scarce agricultural land plots, particularly depending on, on, on where this falls within the agricultural season. Um, I think where there are large numbers of, of international migrants, um, I think this may well lead to more tensions and problems. Um, I mean, they, they may well be overlooked by government relief programs or, or other support measures. Um, and as I said earlier, they, they also may face local discrimination as they may, uh, may be seen as, as carriers of COVID or, or whatever. So I, I think that's something to, to monitor closely. Um, and I think overall, I think, uh, as I said, I think this is going to drive more intra and inter community disputes over, over land um, as more and more pressure, as more, more, more people need to uh, use land and, 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 and live off the land. I think just two quick comments on, on, how, on, on how to respond. So firstly, again, uh, on, on data, I think, I think we need to be looking forward ahead to try and understand where, where some of the hotspots are going to be in which countries and which areas. Uh, and I mean, those those um, who, with kind of partners on the ground obviously will be getting some sense of this or have some idea already. But I think we need better, better, uh, better sort of forward looking. Um, one of our partners called TMP Systems has developed uh, what they call the COVID-19 conflict risk model, which is trying to look at how um, the, the, the lockdown and secondary impacts are um, layering on top of existing risks to try and work out where, where conflict may occur, which I think is quite an interesting approach. And then secondly, I think this times like this, I think really highlight the importance for local systems to resolve disputes and to prepare communities to manage um, um, pressure and, and, and disputes over land. Um, we, uh, DFID works with um, uh, NAMATI, a, 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 a global legal empowerment network that works with paralegals uh, on the ground, working with communities and also um, a, a program to, to build um, Communities understanding of how they manage land and the governance structures within that, and I think, I think there's a need to kind of resource and support approaches like that uh, in many countries, particularly where 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 pressure on land is already uh, high and where um, the a crisis like this can really tip um, communities over into into much more serious uh, conflicts and disputes. Let me stop there. Thank you, Chris. Um, Carl, what will be the anticipated impact on food systems, health services, and uh, education of adding potentially so many new residents to sparsely populated areas? Thanks, Julia. Uh, I, I, I'll build on what my colleagues have just said about, about you know, absorption of, of, uh, of uh, urban to rural migrants in responding to that. And I think they, they've covered it really well. There's, there needs to be a statutory, you know, government led response um, to supporting uh, um, uh, uh, migrants and displaced persons. And that can, I think uh, Chris made the mention of cash. It does and will involve um, the use of cash and social transfers to uh, act as a safety net for the most vulnerable. And I think that's, that uh, applies to um, food security in particular. Uh, it's really critical um, in the next four to six months that um, that nutrition is protected, and that's going to mean the use of of cash and voucher-based safety nets uh, for the most vulnerable. So, we're we're that's something that we're particularly worried about. I I wouldn't. Um, 
uh, also underestimate the resilience of community structures themselves. Uh, statutory response is incredibly important, but we're also collecting testimony from several hundred women, for example, in West Africa right now, and they are telling us then, you know, well, we've, we've been through drought, we've been through conflict, we've been through displacement before, uh, we, have, we have power and agency and capacity um, to be able to to respond to this, they are on the front line. So so whatever uh, government in interventions there are, or or NGOs or other actors, they need to get behind those existing localized structures, uh, particularly when it comes to food and nutrition security, uh, and making sure that that um, uh, either cash or or vouchers or inputs. Uh, are provided. So I think input supply chains right now are particularly important that they're not disrupted so people can, uh, particularly the most marginalized, that they can access those seeds that they need to plant right now if it's raining and if it's, uh, uh, you know, seasonality is, is something that's, that's important um, for protecting that food and nutrition security. I'll, I'll stop there, Julia. Thanks, Carl. Um, over to you, Chris. Uh, what do you see as the anticipated impact on food systems, health services, education, other uh, you know, staple services of adding so many new residents into sparsely populated areas? Yeah, thanks, Julia. Um, and I, um, as, I've, as I've been saying all along, I think I think this will vary a lot from country to country, um, and so. Um, I think there are so many different variables that will will drive this, so we need to understand those those better. Um, certainly on 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 food, um, Diffid is working with a whole bunch of global partners like FAO and uh, the and IFPRI and others to really understand how food prices are changing um, at the local level and how they interact with regional and global prices. And so there's a lot of focus on that and concern also about how the current crisis may be exacerbating existing food security problems in, in, in some regions. Um, in terms on, on, of the impact on food and health and education systems overall, I mean, obviously, in, in many ways, this depends on kind of the baseline and how resilient and how much capacity there is. Yes, I, I agree with Carl. I think, I mean, many communities uh, have long-standing coping mechanisms, but I guess um, when these shocks get laid upon others, then at, at some point um, they, 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 uh, they, they will reach a breaking point. Um, and I think, I, I think this is correct, but I, I, think, I think only about 5% uh, of population in Africa have access to social protection systems. And, and many of those are probably not scalable either and won't respond in the short term. So I think, I think that there may well still be a significant gap. On just coming back to food systems in particular, um, I mean, I think globally we're in a relatively strong position if we compare this to the 2007-8 uh, financial and, and then food price spikes. Um, and so I think that the, the real challenge is affordability, uh, urban workers and others who've lost their jobs, a lack of remittances. Um, and so in the short term, I think that's the main concern. Um, but I think there are a number of countries where the lockdown is exacerbating existing food security crises. I'm thinking of countries like Yemen, Sudan, South Sudan, Nigeria in particular, but there's another group of countries where who are at high risk with millions could, um, 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 who are facing food security challenges. Um, and so I think this could be building to a perfect storm if appropriate steps aren't taken in the, in the, in the coming months. Um, so I think we need to, to, to kind of monitor that very closely. And then I think my final point is that I think what we haven't really understood yet also is, is how how the lockdown um, may affect medium term food security um, because we're, we're receiving reports of how the disruptions to labor and also input supplies is affecting um, how uh, uh, planting and, and some supply chains. And so this may lead to a knock on effect in the months ahead, which I think we also need to kind of understand better and prepare for. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and uh, we'll move to the next question, but I just wanted to quickly lift up something that Carl said, which is uh, underscoring the importance of the resilience of community structures themselves uh, and you know, in the importance of looking for solutions wherever they may exist, particularly those that already do exist. And we see this even uh, here in the US, uh, the springing up of mutual aid networks and things like that. So I think that that's quite an important point. And also Chris's point, of uh, looking not just in the short term to deal with the current shock, but into the medium term as well. 
Our next question is uh, related to remittances. Many people in rural areas rely on remittances from relatives in cities to build and maintain their homes. What will happen when these remittances dry up? Uh, as levels of remittances drop, how can uh, these investments be protected? Uh, Carl, let's start with you. Could you uh, give us your thoughts? Thanks, Julia. Uh, this is a great question as well. And, and just a bit of background. We've been carrying out rapid gender analyses uh, right across our programs. I think we've got 51 complete at this stage. And we started with a global uh, gender analysis. What's, what's the, the impact and likely impact of this crisis uh, on gender equality and the status of women in our programs? Um, and looking at it particularly from, um, from a protection and uh, uh, gender-based violence perspective, and Shipra has already touched on that. Uh, and I want to focus on that in particular um, um, the majority of, in our uh, Mekong Delta, the Mekong region gender analysis that we did, we have uh, uh, found that, that generally uh, migrant workers who are women spend or send more of their income home. Um, and also the majority of remittances recipients in rural areas are women. Um, so th the immediate impact is obvious. If there is disruption to the labour market and uh, unemployment and loss of daily labour in urban areas, which we're seeing, that has an immediate impact on, uh, uh, on women and uh, their nutritional status, because we know there's correlation between um, how women use household cash uh, uh, and, and how it supports um, family nutrition. So again, it brings up the worry of, of the impact this is going to have or having on, uh, on, on food and nutrition security. So it's, it's a really difficult challenge, this one. It, it comes back to protecting as far as possible employment, um, making it easier for uh, remittances to be transferred uh, and supporting, um, I think Chris's point was great about the fact that 5%, I think, of... of uh, uh, of, of, of Africa has access to formal social protection. So what, that, that's a huge gap. Um, so finding alternative means um, to move cash through mobile-based mobile uh, um, uh, mechanisms or supporting village savings and loans associations or, or other uh, informal savings and lending groups at community level. That's, uh, that's something that we're looking at through, uh, through our partners using mobile technology um, to support those existing savings and lending groups, which have which have proven to be uh, extremely resourceful and successful in in um, in protecting uh, food security at at uh, community level. Thank you, Carl uh, Shipra. Turning to you, what are you seeing emerging in India when it comes to the question of remittances? Yeah, I'll come to the question of India, but I also want to thank Carl for sharing such a significant and important data that uh, more women are sending back their remittances. And back there in the rural areas, it's also women who are uh, recipients of, uh, of these. I mean, it, I, it just underscores the importance and gender dimension of the crisis. In India as well, I think uh, pre-COVID remittance comes from migrants in the cities. Uh, were usually used to provide stability to the fluctuations of the agricultural economy back there in rural areas. In the absence of these remittances, there will certainly be a need to stabilize farm incomes and there will be pressure on agriculture. To this end, the farming sector will see a new demand as well, I think for irrigation, for insurance and for climate adaptivity too. I think there will be greater demand for contract farming arrangements too. Also, COVID has disrupted uh, a lot of supply chains, big supply chains uh, that cross state and national boundaries. Uh, and I think this can provide impetus for agro processing to happen closer to the production centers in rural areas, focusing on agricultural and allied processing facilities supporting micro, small, and medium enterprises, creating a space for more financing institutions, uh, 
and also non-banking financial companies. I think all of these can really strengthen lo uh, local economies and provide opportunities for both existing and returning inhabitants. And I think the changing times, there is also a need to provide them the necessary skills for emerging times and at the same time support them uh, through wage programs. Government of India has a, has a flagship program which is called National Rural Employment Guarantee Schemes and it guarantees 100 days of employment for rural people. And in the meantime, I think there is currently, there is certainly a need to widen the scope of these sorts of program, as well as to look at strengthening its implementation. Uh, uh, other panelists have also talked about uh, rural people, the resilience of rural people. Uh, I think that's very true. And it's also important to remember that the migrants who are returning to the villages probably will bring back a new set of skills, experience, and perspectives from their exposure to the urban areas. So I'm hoping they will bring a lot of innovation to the rural lives, rural markets, rural economies, and all the adversities that they have been through will likely make them even more resilient in coming days. Thank you. Thanks, Shipra, and uh, thank you for providing a potential positive outcome of some of this migration, which I think we'll explore a bit more in the Q&A. Chris, uh, turning back to you and switching tracks a bit, uh, how do we protect the properties that people are leaving behind when they leave the cities? Uh, for example, from squatters, uh, how do we ensure that people can return to uh, the homes that they once lived in once the lockdowns lift? Yeah, thank you, Julia. So I think this is a really interesting question, and I think uh, and I think it's it's important. Um, but I think I think I'm not sure it's the the most pressing question that we should be asking right now, uh, based on the the evidence of what has happened to date. But I'm interested to hear from participants on the, on on this webinar in terms of what they're seeing. Um, as I noted earlier, I think maybe a more pressing question is what the crisis reveals about existing weaknesses in tenure rights. And and I think in terms of that question. Um, I think the precarious rights of people in formal settlements seem to be particularly uh, relevant and, and uh, um, uh, highlighted by what's going on. Uh, I think many of us will have seen some report, reports of, of mass evictions in Nairobi recently um, and in some other cities around the world, which seem to be at least partly um, um, escalating or, or brought forward during the, during the lockdown. Um, and I think in other, in other parts of the world, there's a fear, um, uh, which um, some of our partners report back to us, that the pandemic will be used as a pretext to invict residents on public health or other grounds after the lockdown or, or even during the lockdown. On the other side, I've, I've heard, uh, I understand that in the Philippines, um, there has been um, a decision to, to, to um, prohibit uh, demolitions and evictions during the pandemic. Um, um, and so obviously that also highlights that, that governments are responding to this in different ways and there's, there, are, there are opportunities maybe to, to influence this, which I think uh, is really important. I think another important dimension to this is the risk um, to renters um, who lose their jobs. Uh, and this is obviously a massive issue uh, in many places around the world. I understand that in Bangladesh, um, about uh, people in informal settlements have seen their incomes drop by about 80%. Um, and so uh, even in formal settlements, you still have to pay rent. Uh, how is this going what, what is this going to mean for people's shelter and uh, basic human rights um, and, uh, and, and their security? Um, so I think that's something we need to think about a little bit more. So I think uh, just in terms of what we do about this, I think, I think firstly, there's, I think there's a need to mobilize uh, more global awareness that this is still an important issue that despite the, the huge public health and other challenges, uh, land rights are still on the agenda and the, the, the different international players are, are, are working on this and, and looking at this and it's not something that was dropped off the agenda somehow. Um, and I think also there's maybe, uh, I, I guess this, the, 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 the crisis highlights the important work needed to strengthen uh, tenure rights incrementally. Um, and I'm thinking uh, another uh, partner that we support, uh, Cadaster, um, uh, is an organization that gives tools to communities to map and document their rights as a sort of incremental step towards 
um, recognition. And I think, uh, and, and they, they've stepped up their work in a number of countries, uh, even during the lockdown through their local partners. And I think there's, there's a need to support much more work uh, at that level um, so that you prepare for, for, for challenges like this. Um, and, uh, but that's, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a partial solution, but some, I think it's an important thing that we need to think about more. Thank you. Thanks, Chris, and uh, thanks for bringing up this uh, really critical issue of evictions, which was uh, the topic of yesterday's webinar as well. Um, Igor, turning to you, um, how do we protect properties that people are leaving behind, uh, and how do we ensure that they can return uh, once the lockdown lifts? Well, again, you know, the two questions and one example in the middle of that you have, you know, for example, from squatters, you know, they are connected, you know, I mean, the, how do we, how do we protect the properties and how do we make, make sure that there is a return that are connected, you know, and I think when it, when we talk about protection, you know, in the context of, of land and property rights, we should be also thinking about uh, protection in, in the general human rights, you know, so we should be looking also uh, uh, at the issue of, of housing rights, you know. So I think we cannot untangle the two separately, you know. So of course, you know, while thinking about you know the most vulnerable population, we should be thinking about both about land and property rights as well as as well as general human rights, including the right right, right to housing. And uh, at the emergence of, of this crisis, there was one very vocal uh, uh, advocate for this, the special former special rapporteur on on right to housing. She was very very vocal on the issue of how do we protect the uh, the, the the housing rights, especially of the homeless people, and this will remain the challenge. Uh, hence, you know, some of the countries, they have done well in terms of, you know, those one who have been focusing on protection of, let's say, uh, from eviction of the of the population in informal settlements. So uh, that has been, you know, uh, probably a, a, a good move forward. And uh, uh, well, some probably they have done a less well job. I mean, there has been reports, you know, uh, from, from, from developed countries where the, the homeless people, they have found themselves in a very difficult situation you know, where they supposed to stay at home while they don't have one. Uh, so that, that remains a challenge, you know. So I think, you know, we can need to take a vulnerability approach to this and focus our attention in terms of protection on those ones who are vulnerable. In most of the cases, you know, where we have uh, people who are leaving uh, their, their habitat in an urban area and migrate back to the area of origin, these would be people uh, who, who basically rent. Very few of them would be probably the owners. You know? I mean, we are talking about most of them migrant workers, you know, and they will likely have a rent. So in that context, I think when if you think about return, you know, the idea would be to look at the tenancy rights, you know, and if you look at the tenancy rights, you know, I think, you know, we need to go back and, 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 and see uh, uh, which countries uh, have sufficiently robust system in terms of protection on, on tenancy and land and property rights as well. In urban areas, there, there is a tendency to have a more statutory approach to this, so that should not be a, such, a, uh, uh, such a challenge. The question is whether in force. And then the other mechanism or the other set of rules and against which we need to, uh, you know, sort of... Uh, uh, a look against, you know, would be the, the general uh, 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 human rights obligation that all the states have, including the 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 the, the right to the right to housing. You know. So, um, um, I mean, uh, yes, it, it is a challenge, uh, but it's not an insurmountable one. And I think, you know, most of the states they would have an effective legislation which should protect the land and property or tenancy rights on the other side. Uh, as well as uh, uh, certain social, certain social mechanisms which should which should enable access to basically housing for those ones who are vulnerable, uh, uh, like the homeless people. All right, thank you. Thank you, Igor. Uh, Carl, turning to you, uh, we're seeing an interesting phenomenon as we see increased mobility restrictions and lockdowns. We see that some people are being stranded far from their homes. Uh, I believe it was the New York Times that reported a week or two ago that um, thousands of Nigerian citizens were stranded, for example, in the Emirates. Uh, what are the properties in, property rights implications of this uh, phenomenon? Thanks, Julia. Uh, uh, I'm going to zone in on the on the gender or a gender dimension of this question. Um, Normally, I mean, in, in, in normal circumstances, women are women provide three times more caregiving time than men. Um, and and, and that's, that starts to, if you think about, for example, school closures uh, and restrictions on travel 
um, uh, that arise from lockdowns, it's going to have or is having an immediate impact on uh, those caregiving responsibilities that women have. Now, I'm thinking particularly from our program perspective, so uh, uh, generally rural parts of the global south, so Asia and, uh, and Africa in particular. Um, so th the issue of school closure in particular is increasing, immediately increasing uh, domestic care burdens for women. Um, most agricultural labor, certainly in Africa, is female labor. So when you start to think about the increased domestic care burden and the impact that, ha that has on the productive capacity, agricultural productive capacity uh, of women, th there you start to see the implications um, and the, uh, the dangers. Land is likely to lay fallow if women can't put as much labor onto the, onto the land as, as uh, they may have had in the past. But, but what's also possible and that we've seen in the past is that there would be appropriation of that land um, from either extended family members returning or people who don't uh, own the land at all, uh, particularly when, when women's property rights are um, often not respected at all. So there's a there's a challenge there from the gender uh, perspective on on um, on on ownership and the productivity. There's a correlation there that that uh, needs some attention, uh, and of course the, the 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 often the coping mechanisms there are um, uh, early entry into into marriage of young girls or engagement in transactional sex. Um, as a coping mechanism to avoid a distress sale um, if indeed women own uh, land and have a property title uh, to avoid sale they, they engage in other um, coping mechanisms so it, it has it has huge complications this uh, another another one I just pull out before I stop is the is the information technology gap there's a, there's a gender gap in access to technology not just ownership of of mobile phones or access to the internet for women but also their uh, literacy issues so when you're talking about um, land titling or access to information about uh, about assets such as land there's an immediate um, uh, bias in in uh, in the way that uh, information is accessed so uh, lots to think about there and it's not uh, these are not uh, easily addressed either i'll stop there pass over and you Thanks, Carl, and uh, thanks for lifting up the gender dimension of this phenomenon, again, uh, showing that this crisis is not hitting all groups equally, uh, even in some unexpected ways. Igor, uh, can we get your thoughts on the property rights implications of mobility restrictions? I mean, land and property rights, tenancy rights, as well as any other human rights, they are portable in principle. So, you know, it doesn't really matter, you know, whether the person is on the move, whether they are stopped by some reason, you know, they still have, regardless of the location or the intention, you know, they still have their land and property rights as any, any other uh, human rights. So the state has a responsibility to protect the, the rights. But in some cases, state can also act in a predatory way. And we have seen a situations in a conflict situation, for example, which are in a way not dissimilar because the people cannot return home at the moment. They are stuck at the, at the locations where they are, where the state, they have usurped the, 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 the opportunities in order to be able to, to, to uh, 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 de deprave people from their land and property rights. And that's what happened in many cases. You know, in the most recent case, if you look, would be in the case of Syria, where there has been a, a specific uh, laws brought forward. There has been specific institutions being created, you know, in order to deprive people who have been displaced for a long time and who are prevented from going back or moving any, in any direction uh, 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 to, to, in order to, to acquire their legally or, uh, uh, in some cases, legally, uh, their, land and, their, their land and property. Uh, so, yeah, it is an issue there, over there. In terms of, you know, uh, making sure that the states are not acting in predatory way and using the opportunity to, you know, acquire land for the purpose of development or personal gains or whatever it is, you know, I think, you know, in monitoring mechanisms should be there and should be in place. Uh, and, you know, I mean, and this monitoring mechanism can be national, the National Human Rights Commission can monitor and should monitor the situation very, very uh, 
uh, uh, uh, carefully, but there also there is a role that needs to be played by the international community, including human rights organizations, including human rights advocates, uh, including international organizations as well. So I think you know, in terms of you know ensuring that the people, whether they are prevented uh, uh, to move or not, uh, we all have a role to play over there. And uh, I think you know the uh, best thing that we can do for now is to monitor uh, state behavior, whether they comply or not with our own national legislation in terms of protection and with the, what we consider as international standards. Over, thank you. Thank you, Igor. Uh, we will turn now to the final question uh, before the Q&A portion. A uh, reminder to the audience that if you'd like to submit a question, uh, now is the time to do so using the uh, Q&A feature on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, for our final question, uh, let's turn to Shipra. Uh, this crisis is also impacting migrants who had already been on the move uh, before the COVID-19 pandemic. What are some of the housing, land, and uh, property rights responses and options for these migrant populations? Shifra, I think you might be on mute. Yeah, thank you for reminding you, Leah. Yeah. And thank you for this question. I think the agonies uh, suffered by migrants, it's, it's, it's a result of the system that we are living in. One that uh, conveniently ignored those who are key engines of productivity and have built, actually built the cities. Some people are raising even the more basic question on calling them migrant. The word migrant worker sounds deliberately disempowering and kind of seizes the assertion of residents in the cities that, try, that thrive on the, on the labor of these people. It's very much possible that in a few months, uh, they will again have no option in their villages and will have to come to cities for work. But to invite them back to the cities, we need to build a sense of trust in them. I think we need to make sure that their rights and their dignity is upheld and that they get safe housing and other social security prospects in the urban destinations. In India, we have actually seen a complete absence of coordination between the source states of migrants, uh, which are relatively poorer and from which uh, migrants move to the other states and the host states, which are actually the uh, more thriving and, uh, and uh, uh, better states in terms of prosperity. A huge, a huge number of migrants, <coughs> a, new, a huge number of migrants uh, that were staying in the uh, urban destinations, they were not registered as migrant labor either uh, at either of the places. I mean, neither in the, uh, in the, in the, rural, in the, in the states from, of origin or in the host states. And because of this, there were a lot of difficulty in offering relief measures. So this coordination between states and the related services really needs to go better. Several states in India are also repealing the labor laws uh, uh, to encourage investments from bigger enterprises. And I really don't think it's a good choice or if this is going to be sustainable in the long run. Diluting labor laws is only going to worsen the condition of workers, more so for women workers, and it may push them further out of the labor force. The repealing of laws uh, would mean weaker or no protection for them. Uh, for example, maternity, ben maternity benefits, or for work in the night shifts, or for their safety and security when they're working at any places. So, there is really a need to rectify these missing gender dimensions from the changes in labor laws and frame an employment policy which is in line with the ILO gu guidelines and in consultation with women's organizations and the labor welfare unions. So there are a lot of things that need to be done, but I think at a broad level, uh, we need to do a massive attack on the existing inequalities and actually redefine the context of development. We really need to prioritize land and agriculture, prioritize forest and climate, and create a system that prioritizes 
people's lives and livelihoods and a system of connection and compassion, one that's based on justice for all and not just favors you know, certain people and uh, keeps a dis disadvantage another set of people. So th that's like the high level policy responses uh, we can look at. Thank you, Shipra. And I just want to emphasize uh, one of the last points you made, which is that we need to do a massive attack on the existing inequalities. And that's something that we've heard come up over and over again in this webinar. Uh, I also uh, appreciate you raising the point of vocabulary and uh, the way that you know the, the terms and language matters for the dignity of these groups and how they're viewed and treated. Uh, finally, Igor, turning to you, uh, what are some of the housing, land, and property responses and options for uh, refugees internally displaced and other stranded migrants? Well, um, I will go back to, to the mantra that I keep repeating, that the states have a responsibility, you know, for ensuring that the human rights, including land and property rights and housing rights of the people uh, residing on the territory of the state are responsible, actually, for, for ensuring that there is a protection. Uh, so it's a state responsibility, regardless whether we are talking about the national or citizen of the state, or we are talking refugee, or we are talking migrant, that they, they have a responsibility to ensure that there is a basic protection of their uh, uh, general human rights, as well as particularly the rights to housing, and the housing uh, rights to land and property. So uh, uh, apart from that, you know, I mean, uh, the other issue that I think very important, you know, and which particularly affects refugees and IDPs and to a certain extent migrants, is actually uh, making sure that there is a trail or there is a record of the housing plant and property documentation that the people who are on the move would have or would not have with them. And that's a bit of a challenge, you know. In many cases, when people decide to migrate, if they accept economic migrant, then in most of the cases, they will have their land and property documentation in order, regardless whether, whether this is about the property in the place of origin or in other location, doesn't matter, but they wouldn't have it in order. But the things would change very, very significantly if you are talking about people who are forced uh, uh, to migrate, and we are, if you are talking about IDPs and refugees, you know, these people, they tend to flee the locations, you know, where they are because they are aided and treated by natural disaster or by conflict in many cases. And in many cases, it is not the first thing that they think of, you know, uh, where, uh, 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 you know, when, uh, when, they're, when they're about to leave, whether they should take uh, their uh, deed about the property or not. In many cases, they flee for their life, you know. And I think this is an important point, you know. I think, you know, uh, 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 people tend either to uh, not to be able to, their, their, to take their land and property documentation with them when they move, uh, or sometimes they lose it on the way. Sometimes it's confiscated by, you know, rebels, authorities, you know, whatever it is. Uh, so I think, you know, making sure that there is an adequate protection or opportunity for the people facilitated opportunity for the people to store and keep their land and property documentation in order for the purpose to be able to use it once they are back, you know, I think that's a very important point. You know? So in terms of responses, yes, again, to recap, uh, it would be the state responsibility to provide, you know, protection of, for all the rights, including housing, land and property rights. And it is also perhaps uh, looking about what the international community should do They're looking at the issue of protecting the land and property documentation in the area of origin on in transit while they're migrating and or in the area of destination once they, once they arrive. Thank you. Thank you, Igor, and thank you to all the panelists for the discussion. We've uh, covered a lot of ground uh, and we have several questions from the audience, which we will now turn to. Uh, if you have a question, uh, you can still post it in the chat feature. So our first question is actually uh, related to the topic of Tuesday's webinar on women's land rights, but I think that this topic is so critical that it bears raising and discussing in this webinar as well. The question is this, uh, COVID is a widow maker uh, and widows, as we know, are often the most marginalized groups uh, subject to human rights violations, uh, including disinheritance of their land. How can we ensure that widows' rights are protected in the context of this crisis? And how do we build better uh, to address uh, these widows' rights going forward to their land and also food security? Uh, this is a question for all of the panelists. Uh, so if uh, I'll just uh, pause for a moment and uh, we'll leave it to whoever would like to, to 
uh, jump in on this question. Yulia, I'll, I'll jump first. I'll give it a go. It's, it's a great question. And thank you, uh, Heather, for, for raising this. Um, I mean, I'm not a, a specialist on, on, on land rights in, in particular, but, but um, uh, we, have, we have a strong interest in the gender dimension of all of this. And all I can say is, is, that, we, is that we really need to, to hold the line with, with, our, with rights based approaches. Um, Igor has mentioned several times the responsibilities of the state, uh, and there are globally recognized and signed treaties and conventions that establish or, or define these rights. So we, we, we really need to be stronger as a community to invoke those rights, protect them, and, uh, and work with governments to, 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 to you know, inf uh, first of all, make the reforms if they need to be made, or secondly, uh, which, is, which is actually more commonly the case, is to actually implement the policies that they already have. Um, and there are lots of ways of doing that progressively. But uh, I think, you know, rights um, are there and they're there to be protected. So I would, um, you know, my response would be to encourage that. I, um, the United Nations family has a, a big responsibility, but there are, as I say, conventions out there uh, underway right now is the development of a work stream and the development of voluntary guidelines on the integration of gender equality and women's empowerment in food and nutrition security and that is going to address the issue of land rights um, and it's going to be developed by the constituency of of the the committee on food security so it will eventually become uh, uh, soft international law and, and and that's another instrument that we can look forward to but there are others there that we need to uh, invoke as often uh, and as constructively as we can uh, if, I, you, if i may add uh, can i uh, yeah go ahead igor uh, and then go ahead, go ahead Shibra. okay thank you so i will build on uh, what carl said and i would emphasize that uh, stronger rights for widows actually 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 first require a recognition of them as equal humans in the society so in especially in the in, in the cultural paradigm that we have probably in india so the widow the widow women are considered a little lesser than those who are married and those who are in a uh, those who are in a marital relationship so uh, so the key is to recognize them as equal humans and then recognize their rights in law as equal humans. So a lot of laws in India, when they provide rights to widows, they just provide them the maintenance rights. They do not, do not provide them the rights to actually control and have full ownership over the land that they inherit in their marital families. And uh, so I think there is a need to you know, rectify and change these laws at the first place so that these laws become equal and recognize women as, uh, uh, as full citizens in themselves. Secondly, I think rural women at a lot of places themselves are not aware of whatever rights are available to them through laws. So it's important to, to organize land literacy programs for them so that they are they are fully aware of the rights which are available to them. Thirdly, I think within the entire revenue system, which holds the responsibility to grant them the, uh, the available rights, they themselves are not sensitive enough and uh, they kind of subsume the identity of women within the household. So we, we really need to separate this out and see them as, an, as, a, as a separate individuals. And it's, it's really important, it really becomes important in the context to, uh, to conduct a lot of sensitization uh, programs for revenue officials and people who are, who are all responsible for land allocation in the entire you know, land governance value chain. So it's, it's, it's important for them to be sensitive. And lastly, I think it's also important to have support centers for women. As I'm, I talked about self, self help groups in Kerala in several other places, there are uh, women who come together as groups, several kinds of groups. So these support groups actually provide them a lot of strength in, in, in addressing any of the challenges that they come across. 
and uh, i think within the government institutions also there can be specifically designated windows where women can uh, go and seek help in the given context in india the entire revenue system the entire land governance system is so patriarchal that it's even dif even difficult for a woman to walk in and you know get some information and get their issue resolved so if there are some windows some you know designated uh, people within the land governance department which can act as key people where these women can go i think all of this will help strengthen land rights especially for widow women but in general for all women some of these points thank over you shepra to you, over to you to you igor yeah uh, i mean i just wanted to mention you know i mean there uh, in some countries where there is already a strong litigation tradition you know there is already a discussion about compensation for the impact of covid you know and this could range from a variety of uh, impacts that people uh, have suffered you know some of them in some countries there would be a legal action against the state because of the prevention measures and because of the economic loss in other countries where it would be there would be an action because of the lack of measures and therefore you know uh, a death that we, which was which was preventable etc but uh, what is out there is that definitely some countries are already considering compensation schemes you know and particularly in us uh, 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 there was one gen there is one gentleman uh, uh, who is was a lawyer and who is a lawyer and who was managing the uh, the compensation fund for the 911 as well as the uh, the compensation fund for the British uh, BP uh, uh, disaster in the in the Gulf, uh, Ken Fenberg, and he is already advocating for in introducing a compensation scheme for the victims, including variety type of victims. You know, those ones who lost who lost lives. You know, the, the those ones who who were injured and suffered. You know, uh, long term. You know, disabilitating condition. Those ones who lost jobs. Those ones. Uh, uh, who were exposed because of the jobs to COVID, you know, so they're already considering, you know, in some countries there is a consideration, you know, of compensation scheme. So I think, you know, uh, looking at the victims of, of, of COVID, you know, and there could be wide categories, and so some of them would be the widows, then would be the orphans, you know, in some cases, you know, the state should take a proactive approach rather than wait, you know, these cases to be brought to the courts. And there should be some administrative mechanisms where the state would establish the pool of victimhood uh, among different uh, strata of the population who have been affected by the COVID and design a program which is uh, sort of an appropriate and which will uh, address, you know, the impact of the COVID. So uh, just wanted to highlight that aspect of it. Thank you. Thank you, Igor. Okay, uh, moving on to uh, our next question, uh, again, to all of the panelists. So uh, please feel free to chime in. Uh, if uh, you would like to respond. Uh, we are anticipating that this crisis will last for quite some time, uh, a matter of potentially years. So uh, is it safe to assume or uh, would you assume that this is not just a temporary phase of de-urbanization, uh, but that this might signal a larger uh, urban rural migration? And if so, um, what do you see as the potential impacts of a longer term migration pattern? Yulia, shall I, shall I start? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think this is a, is a really important question that we need to understand uh, and, and um, get our heads around as, as, as soon as we can. Um, and I think um, in, in, in many ways, the, the, the lockdown probably will be temporary. I mean, obviously, we're, we're, we're not sure about second, third waves. Uh, many of us are trying to get our heads around this in our own countries, let alone in other countries. Um, I think I think what is maybe more concerning is the sort of the secondary economic impacts, uh, and those are already kind of being felt around the world. And I think they will have a much longer tail with uh, reduced jobs, particularly in, in urban centres, as the international economy can contract. And I think that that may well lead to um, uh, um, people staying in situ. I mean, a, a lot of the urban to rural migration has been driven by job losses in the short term or job or factory closures. Um, in some cases, probably also concerns around around the pandemic and, and wanting to retreat to kind of rural areas where living costs are cheaper and that people feel maybe less exposed. Um, 
But as that kind of lessens, the question is, will the jobs materialize? Obviously, many people went in search of jobs in, in urban centers in the first place because um, they because of income pressures and the lack of um, opportunities in rural areas, and they haven't they haven't gone away. Um, I guess the other question is, is a lot of the rural economy obviously is driven by urban demand for food and other services and goods, and that's also contracting. So I, I don't think, I think we need to begin to think through what, what, what does, what, what, how do our international and local and national systems are all geared to um, urbanization and sort of a de facto assumption that everything's moving towards urban cities. How, how do they need to be recalibrated and rethought if there is a, a longer term um, movement to rural areas and, and pressures in rural areas uh, increase? Um, and I think we're just sort of at the beginning of thinking that through. But as, as I said at the beginning, um, I think this will look very different from country to country. Um, and so that's where we really need to understand uh, in which context this really may look like a, a longer term shift. Uh, and what does that then mean for, for, for systems and markets and, and how governments uh, need to respond and the international system as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chris. Uh, would anyone else like to chime in on this particular question? Uh, very briefly, Yulia, I think I think Chris has has covered it really well there. I, 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 it's a question of time, right, to see how this how this develops. Um, I think re rebooting the rural economy could be something that that um, you know is is a is a beneficial outcome in the in the short and medium term. And I think uh, Shipra touched on it as well, the fact that it, it really exposes the need for sustainable uh, food systems and, and um, revitalization of, 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 uh, of agriculture that is sustainable and equitable and, and productive. Um, so so, so the, the out-migration particularly of, of young people may offer Opportunities there. It's it's um it's it's early days, but um, I don't see major deurbanization as a long term result of this. Uh, if anything, um, market towns, uh, medium sized towns would would, would grow, um, uh, and um, the bigger urban centres stabilise eventually. But um, that's just conjecture at this stage. Uh, fantastic. Thank you, Carl. Um, staying on this topic, uh, and uh, perhaps we'll just open it up to uh, one or two of the panelists so that we can move through some of the questions. Um, what do you see uh, as the potential impact on urban design um, of this crisis? So for a long time, density has been the goal of urban planners. Um, how do we design dense cities that can also be resilient to uh, this type of crisis, uh, you know, both from a public health standpoint, but also from a property rights standpoint in terms of, for example, affordable housing and better housing? Have I stumped the panel? I think, uh, I think. Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I just coming back to my, my point at the beginning. So I, I think what this crisis does is sort of it, it, it highlights uh, the, the existing problems and challenges. Um, I mean, if they needed highlighting uh, and, and, and brings them into sharper relief. And so I think the, 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 the pressures um, uh, and, and conditions in urban informal settlements um, which um, are only uh, increasing in many contexts um, I think um, I think I think now is really a, an opportunity to kind of bring them back into 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 the discussion again, or to highlight the, the challenges and really think through how, how we build cities in the future and, and what the land implications of that mean um, uh, of those are right. And how do we create um, um, urban uh, growth uh, and and settlements um, with all the pressures around uh, property rights and the, and the political settlement, uh, which often constrains uh, better urban development, um, and so I think I think I think this is an opportunity maybe to 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 really think uh, how we can uh, build back better, if you will. There, there's a there's an ILC uh, webinar next week looking at this question in particular, 
So I think there's a whole range of questions that 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 really need um, urgent attention. There's an opportunity maybe to to also use some of the ch the challenges that the, the crisis has has created to 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 shine a light on those. Julia, very quickly as well. I I think um, um, it you know the media has exposed to the, the massive um, it has ma you know exposed massive inequalities as a result of this um, pandemic uh, right across the world. Uh, and and I think the way that many um, people live in urban slums. Uh, is one of those things that has come to light for a lot of people uh, that, that, that perhaps they weren't aware of. Um, so I think, uh, as Chris said, there's opportunity here. There's opportunity for big change because we've been exposed to some of the gross inequalities and, and, um, uh, and discrimination that's been, that's been going on. I think it's an opportunity for urban agriculture. Uh, again, if, if anything, this is exposing the dependency on many urban, large urban centres on uh, 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 rural agricultural produce and, and those supply chains, which are which are often really fragile anyway, without a lot of cold storage or, or ability to get fr fresh produce into massive urban centres. So I think there's an opportunity for urban planners to think about urban food security and urban agriculture, and particularly the nutrition dimension of that as a result of this uh, pandemic. Thank you, Carl. Uh, Shipra, turning to you, um, what do you see as the impact of this crisis on tribal communities and in particular in India, uh, what impact will this crisis have on the implementation of the Forest Rights Act? So I think in the tribal in the tribal communities, a lot of these people used to go to the urban urban spaces to get their uh, to get their get their daily earnings. Now they are back into the uh, into the forest areas. It is going to pressure on commons. And I think what's more important is to get the FRA Act implement implemented with the rights of women recognized. I mean. Within the forest right acts that's there in India, there are a lot of processes which makes it uh, which makes it truly participatory. But these things are not implemented in spirits. So I think it's all the more important now to uh, have those rights clearly recognized for tribal. We have the clearly clearly recognized rights the forest produce and the forest land where they have been living for ages and they do not uh, suffer from uh, they do not suffer from the threats of every the people in the uh, forest department so i think that way it's really important thanks shipra this next question is for igor uh, several panelists have mentioned the need to rely on the resilience of populations, communities, and local governance systems. However, um, in this period, the trend is seems to be going instead towards uh, the strengthening of state control over citizens. So how do you overcome this paradox and continue to strengthen, strengthen local land governance systems? I mean, I think, you know, we, am I on? Yes, I'm on. I think you know we should be very careful that what the state responsibility to protect their citizens doesn't take into state state uh, desire to control their citizens, and, and we we see this in 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 many situations, you know. But in the in, in the same time, on the opposite side, you know, if we live completely, you know, uh, uh, the dealing with the consequences of COVID to the communities, to the individuals, I think that's also abdication of the responsibility of the state. So the state definitely has a role. Is this a question, you know, how to be contained? in a productive way, which will be in, in, in respect of human rights uh, and in, in consideration of the vulnerability of, of, the, of the different of, uh, population. As I mentioned earlier, uh, yes, state have the states have the primary responsibility for it, but they can overstep uh, and then it can abuse their power. And the only way to, to sort of hold them uh, uh, to check and balance is, is to institute you know, uh, monitoring mechanisms to enforce, to, uh, uh, to enforce the existing legislation, which is, in place to empower, you know, the, the the people who are responsible for monitoring the state uh, 
uh, uh, compliance with with, with 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 their own national legislation as well as general human human rights. You know, so I think that's probably the modality. It's a difficult uh, uh, sort of you know uh, uh, thing to balance. Uh, 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 but I think, you know, in the same time, you know, we, we, we cannot leave the state out of equitation. It just needs to be done on a, in, a, in a proper way. Thank you. Thank you, Igor. Uh, opening up, uh, if anybody else wants to jump in on this particular question. Well, just to, just to, br to bring in the private sector into this, uh, Yulia, uh, again, I'm not a specialist, but I, I, I do know that there's, there's the social license platform, which is uh, an initiative of, of Landesa uh, to connect private sector and um, uh, 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 landowners and uh, basically to address the issue of land rights, but respecting land rights, but, but uh, driving uh, uh, food security and, and production in an equitable way. So I think there are innovations out there um, that uh, um, I suppose I suppose I'm saying we shouldn't look at it uh, negatively. That technology is allowing us to do things like this to connect um, uh, not just uh, duty bearers with with citizens, but also with the, the, to, to bring the private sector along in this to to. Um, to make them part of the solution, actually, in in uh, in um, uh, ensuring food security and at the same time respecting land rights. Thanks, Carl. Y Yulia, can I just come in on that, J just to just to add to that? Um, so I, th I think that's a really good point Carl makes, um, and I um, Diffid has been supporting that 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 venture with with Landessa, and I think. I think it's really important to think how we can build the capacity uh, on both of, of both businesses and 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 obviously principally communities to to protect their rights to understand risks to negotiate etc i think one of our our main lessons from a lot of work around responsible land investment has been that yes that's important but actually um coming back to eagle's point you still need the role of the state to enforce transparent systems the rule of law due process and in many countries that 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 is where um there's still a huge gap um, so I think I think coming back to, to to the original question, yes, I think there's a need to support better decentralized systems and capacity, but I don't think that takes away the need to have better central systems and 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 implementation of policy, even if there's many ways of doing that. You don't need to have a sort of one size fits all top down approach. Uh, I think there's still a strong case for for decentralized delivery mechanisms and local uh, empowerment to, to and, and governance structures. But I think I think it's so. I don't think this is a an either or question. I think it's, it's something where we need to bring both both parts together. Thanks, Chris. Um, staying with you and also bringing in uh, Shipra. So uh, you know, on this question of uh, as you said, it's not either or. It's an and. So how do we support? local organizational innovation um, in order to respond to or respond to this pandemic? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a it's a good question. I mean, that, that's obviously where, where in a lot of innovation happens. Right. Um, but I think I think we need to remember that. I mean, the the the, the scale of the crisis, I think, uh, requires us to think beyond just local solutions. I mean, I mean local solutions are, are clearly <laughs> really matter, but I think the idea that communities will be able to handle this, we don't need to w worry. I think clearly, I don't think that's what people are saying, right? And so I think the question is how how do you, how do you connect national systems with with local responses? Um, and obviously, in times of crisis, um, when people are forced to innovate, um, that's often where, where state systems are at their weakest and, and least able to respond to those. So I, I, yeah, I don't think there's any, any, any easy answers to this. Um, but I think, I think in the months ahead, as we look back, we may see some quite interesting new responses to the crisis that have emerged, uh, both in terms of um, dealing with, 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 with income shocks, but also pressures on, on rights. And so I think that's something that we should try and draw on to feed into longer term responses um, so that, so that um, um, we try and learn as much as we can. Uh, I guess all of our lives has kind of been turned upside down in one, one way or another. Even, even this webinar might, might have happened in the margins of a, of a conference uh, last year. Um, 
and so I think I think there's maybe opportunities to to learn from 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 this at all in all at all levels to to see how we can uh, what, what we need to do differently and how we can draw on on how communities and local organisations have responded. Thank you, Chris. Um, and over to you, Shipra. Um, any perspectives that you would like to offer on, you know, particularly seeing the uh, innovation take that you've referenced a few times in Kerala? Yeah, certainly. And again, I mean to refer to, you know, again, refer was that in, in these times of crisis, when the democratic systems were really strong, what happened was Earlier, even at the rural places, the, these uh, rural panchayats in Kerala, they were they were running uh, several centers for for taking care of say old age people. So these kinds of centers are really not available in other parts of India. They are really on, and these centers are actually run by women and and those who are the early governing systems and they are part of the Kudumbashiri. So what happened was at, at these at these at this time of growth when the trends were turning to the rural places, those those centers actually to the ultimately only that connection and compassion in the community each other and towards the to, to, towards towards the adversaries that you know, human human uh, life faces and similarly i mean we have a lot of uh, a lot of distress that migrant people face but simultaneously at a lot of places in urban centers themselves we saw a lot of people coming to offer help to these friends you know innovatively automatically i mean a lot of people coming together uh, to offer food the individual and small philanthropists coming together so i mean to say the intentions they are good and when they are really strong in in terms of the state in terms of the governance at the local level i think innovations then automatically have because of uh, because of interaction of a lot of people and uh, and their ultimate urge to you know come up with some solutions but that doesn't uh, doesn't mean that you know uh, state or the urban people or anybody can be free of the responsibilities that they have or should be all should be held accountable for whatever there is Thank you, Shipra. Uh, we'll turn to our last two questions. Uh, the first question to Igor, and then I will pose a final question to all of the panelists. Uh, Igor, uh, in the instance of forced or coerced displacements from IDP, IDP camps or other collective sites due to COVID infection concerns, how can we support the thousands of families who are being forced to decide between staying uh, and risking uh, life-threatening medical concerns or departing and potentially risking conflict, violence, or further displacement? Well, there is no easy answer to, to this, you know, and I think, you know, I mean, we will see how this develops, you know, as the humanitarian organizations, you know, which are on the forefront of the response and taking care of the IDP camps in most of, in many cases, what kind of mechanisms they will they will develop? You know, I mean, obviously, when it comes to IDPs, the solutions are are limited because IDPs are principally again the responsibility of the state. You know, more so than, for example, refugees. You know, uh, uh, so you know, you know, even the those one who have the, the best intention and perhaps the best know how, you know, might have a limitation in terms of what they can do. Can they, for example, expand the camp in a, in in terms of you know? Uh, 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 having it more stretched so there's a less population per square meter and so and so not if the state doesn't agree to, to do so. I mean, you know, the options are limited, you know, and probably as we speak, some of the options, uh, policy options or technical options uh, are being are being tested on the, on the ground. So I'm afraid, you know, there is no easy answer until we see what's emerging now in terms of response, you know, what has worked and what has uh, doesn't work, you know. Uh, uh, so, uh, and then we will have a lessons learned uh, um, session, I guess, after, after, after all this. Um, I have one more point, but I will leave it to, uh, for the end, which is connected to this, you know, because I perhaps, you know, there will be sort of a summary. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you, Igor. Uh, and turning to the final question uh, for all of the panelists. Uh, if you could conduct a widespread survey of rural residents about their land-related concerns in relation to COVID, what would you ask them? You know, let, let, let me let me start with that and come coming back to my point right right at the beginning um, around data, right? So I think I think it's a great question because I think um, I think we need to understand quick. Uh, and in a much more disaggregated way by country and by region, how this is actually affecting uh, poor people uh, uh, and, and rural people. Carl gave some really good examples and, and Shipra from, 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 from Ghana and from, from India, but I think we need a lot more information. Um, and so doing some, if you could do some rapid surveys, I'd like to understand like how is, is this really, the, the assumptions we're making about how this is panning out and all of us are sort of, sort of coming up with our own theories about how this is playing out. Is this really the case? You know, uh, are there unexpected positive or negative outcomes we're not considering? Um, is pressure on land really increasing? Are, are women really experiencing more intra-household tensions uh, and domestic violence? All these things that we we may have some anecdotal evidence and and and, and theories that we expect, but it'd be really good to to understand that better for for many countries. I have a typical list of questions that they put forward in, in, in similar situation and I would go with those questions again now. So if you're talking about land and property issues in rural areas, the first question would be, is it, is it individual or communal property? I mean, what is the tradition in the particular location? Is it the, the property owned by the entire village or by the clan or by the uh, individual family or by a particular individual? So that's, that's the, the first uh, uh, question. Uh, that, that I would put forward. And then the next question would be, which is I think particularly relevant uh, uh, later on in terms of finding a more long-term solution, is uh, um, uh, whether uh, uh, the, 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 there is a customary system based, uh, which is used to uh, resolve the, dispute, uh, resolution, the, the resolutions in the, 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 the disputes in the, in, the, in the particular location or rely on the states on the courts. So that's a very important question. You know. Uh, and I mean, these would be sort of, you know, the type of question that should inform, you know, the response going, uh, uh, going, going forward, you know, uh, because, you know, it's a different situation if you have a, 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 a firm statutory uh, framework which regulate the land governance system in the country, and it's different if it's really localized and it's based on, on customs, it, and that would also will be very important, for example, for the indigenous population and for the uh, particularly vulnerable uh, sub subgroups uh, of, of population and so on. So, all right, thank you. And uh, I would really add the gender layer to all these questions. And uh, I, I would really be interested in exploring uh, how, how the land use is changing, uh, changing uh, given, given the stress that's coming on the uh, common land or the individual land holdings. And as this land use is uh, is is uh, seeing a change, are women uh, taking part in the decision making bodies? Are their voices being heard at the as this land use is changing? And also at the individual level, when how many women individually own land? When they do own land, did they could they really exercise uh, you know their right in decision making on what to do on that land? And uh, uh, how really did they experience that pressure? You know, given that there, there is an increasing pressure on the limited resources, I, I'm really expecting that, you know, a lot of women who own land or who just who access land in any way will, will, uh, will suffer most, more stress, more pressure to give up their rights. So how are women experiencing all this and how are women taking part and, who actually is hearing their voices or are their voices being ignored? I would really be interested in exploring these dimensions. Julia, very very briefly, I think all the, the, my colleagues have come up with great answers on that, but I guess it depends a lot on who's asking and who's answering. So all of these questions are important. I guess it's, it's about, you know, maybe the question is, um, what can we do or what is it that you need from 
service providers, the public sector, the private sector, the voluntary sector? What, what is it that you need to realize your, your, your potential, your, 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 your food security, your welfare, your safety and your security? And, 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 and if we ask a genuine question and, and we'll get genuine answers, then it's up to us to, to, to find ways to deliver on that. Because if we ask the question, we have to, we have to honor the response. Thank you, Carl, and uh, thank you to all of our panelists for this wonderful discussion. Uh, thank you to the audience. This concludes uh, this third webinar in uh, the Land Rights uh, Implications of COVID-19 series. Before we go, I would just like to remind you that uh, we will be hosting uh, a uh, online discussion on landportal.org on this topic, which will bring together the three threads of the webinars from this week, uh, women's land rights, evictions, and this particular webinar. Uh, the discussion will run from June 3rd to June 24th. And uh, I've just dropped a link in the uh, chat box uh, for how to access the discussion. Uh, thank you again to everyone and uh, please enjoy the rest of your day.